is Kevin Dockery. I am the track director of the Armory. Uh, I very much hope you've had the opportunity to come down and see it. Uh, my people, my red shirts, are there to assist you and make sure that you follow the rules, which is don't touch anything. <laughs> um, the other is no liquids and period. I don't care if it's in a canteen. And uh, costumes, you may be asked, you know, don't, or stand in the middle of a room. Like if you're in the blade room and you got something with huge angel wings, don't get in the blades. They'll snag you, destroy your outfit, and fall on the floor. Um, we try to be safe. That's the primary thing. Uh, their safety and security, they're damn near right next to each other. Last year, I gave this lecture, and I had a young lady uh, come darting past here. She missed hitting one of the blades by half an inch. And she was going to think with the sound system. And it was like, so now we have a rack holding all the blades, mm -hmm. and I stuck myself, and I barely brushed the tip. Mm -hmm. These are live blades. Live blade means it's sharp. Uh, we try to extend to you the courtesy of putting the blades out on a bed of silk, which is the proper display, without scabbards, because it's black, it's wood. There, we're done. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the blade, the steel of the blade, that's the uh, we have uh, some posters for sale of the, uh, it's the chart of the Japanese blade. You'll see it in the blade room, which is Kinesaw. Uh, I think we have two or three copies left, if you like that. Oh, mm. that was a bad idea. <laughs> um, we, the armory is here to inform and educate the attendees in an entertaining way. Part of that is these talks. We have lectures, we have full-blown panels, and we have what we call docents. A docent is a lecture guided by a curator in a museum, usually of a particular specimen or family of specimens. Tomorrow evening is the docent, I hate the most in the world, which is the end of the day, and that's the gun wall. And the only reason we even have it anymore is because we already have all hands on deck, all the red shirts are there, uh, because the moment the, pe the last person left, we close the doors and start tearing down. Uh, we have weapons here solely because we also have a cop and we pay for them. And apparently I paid for one officer's vacation this year. <laughs> which he told me in the parade. <laughs> and I told him to shut up. <laughs> so we are here for you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them to any red shirt. And if they don't know, they will find out. And that includes going, nobody knows. <laughs> so you're out of luck. Or they will find me. In which case, I'll make crap up. <laughs> <laughs> the, I am going to give you my opinion of the, the creation of the Asian blade, finalizing in the Japanese katana. There are arguments, depending on who you talk to, I mean, tremendous national arguments as to how these things got created. They are a work of art. I can barely make one. Uh, and I've done the blacksmithing, I have done the forge work, stock removal, the whole nine yards. These guys are better than I am by an order of magnitude. One of the things we have which is absolutely unique, is a fragment of the metal used to form a Japanese blade, tamahagani. Ugly little spud, isn't it? <laughs> this is what becomes that. They are an art form in and of themselves. But they are not uniquely Japanese. 
I'm sorry, are there any Asians in here besides you, this gentleman? Are there any Japanese in here who aren't Asian? <laughs> okay, fine. Want somebody coming at me with a cocktail? Uh, it it doesn't work that way. It's it's a just uh, one of the things I had been hoping to have, and logistics just screwed it up for me. Was a piece of Woots metal, W O O T Z. That is the original steel, and I mean. Everybody else is in Bronze Age, and the the Indians are cranking out Woods metal. It followed the Silk Road um, to what is now Syria and Damascus, but they're, they're like half the size of a golf ball, pillows of steel. And the Damascus artisans formed them into hammer-welded steel. That became Damascus. It is not, I'm going to give up on the air. <laughs> the stuff that we call Damascus today isn't quite the same thing. It's hammer welded metal, okay? The lines in the pattern, if you will, in the metal is either because of dissimilar metals such as iron and nickel and steel makes a wonderful white pattern. We have some samples of that in the arms room, in the blade room. Or it's very, very faint because that's where the two metals mix and the line is a different carbon content from both. Steel is iron with a certain percentage, less than 2% of carbon in it. That steel. Contaminants, other metals, too much carbon. It's not steel anymore, it's pig iron, which is shock resistant, thermal resistant. You couldn't put that, God couldn't put an edge on that unless he was really pissed. <laughs> the people who first worked steel were the Chinese. My researches give it about 12 to 1800 BC was the Chinese Iron Age, the beginning of it. Before that was Bronze Age. Bronze Age blades are short and small. We don't have any examples this year. Our antiquarian wasn't able to come in. And you're astonished when you see a Bronze Age sword, and it's that long. Because the metal is relatively weak and it'll snap. The great big deal, I mean, this is it, folks. This is the miracle that we were given of steel is that it will heat harden when you quench it. That makes it what we call, in the business, we call glass hard. You have to temper it. Tempering is drawing the hardness back. It's making it softer. But it's doing it to a very limit, to an exacting standard. The Japanese learned this from the Koreans. The Koreans learned it from the Chinese. The Chinese got the bulk of their metal from India. So that's why I call this the birth of the Asian blade. The Chinese would form their swords, and they had two primaries. They had a Jian, J-I-A-N, which was the gentleman's sword. It took expertise to use. And then they had the Dao. D-A-O, that's the warrior's sword. This is a Xi'an. I, I can't even give it justice, I'm horrible. Um, this is sharp enough to shape with. It fits in a, I mean, everything has thought in it. Nothing is just for art's sake or random. So it's thought and then art. This scabbard mouth I'm sorry. 
guard mouth fits over the shape of the scabbard and seals it from water. Okay? It's, it's not just looks way cool and keeps blood from hitting your hand. Um, it's light. It's quick. This, most everyone has seen today as the Tai Chi sword. Except it's, it's flexible. A tai Chi sword is, I'll say, kind of hardened. It's basically spring steel because it's used for a different purpose. This is the weapon. Okay? Feel free to raise your hand if you have a question. Unless I'm moving a play. Then wait. This is a modern version of a Tao. These are used in martial arts a lot. This is actually a martial arts device. In this case, you ready for the thought? That's to stop the blood. <laughs> the cup shape. Because this is a warrior's weapon. And on a very rare occasion, on a decent martial arts, a, a horrible art, martial arts movie, I don't care, you will see an expert work with this weapon and throw it and grab the tassel. <laughs> and you ain't get back. That's six more inches of attack. Cool. The expertise of these, uh, the men who swing these is like, OK, I'm going to get a gun and go half a mile back. <laughs> <laughs> But the Chinese also invented so guns. <laughs> so you can see the heavier blade allows a much greater chopping motion. What this does is allow it to cut through bone. Okay? Or at least cut into bone and ding it up a lot. The, uh, I'm sorry, the bone doesn't necessarily have to be human. You can take a horse's leg off of this. So. These are the traditional, standard Chinese blades. They moved up from China along the coast, and then the technology ended up in Korea, and then jumped the ocean into Japan. Japan is tremendously poor in certain natural resources. Uh, Iron ore is one of them. Coal is another one. It is very difficult to get to. It exists, but it took modern technology to get the Japanese coal. And I'm talking post-World War II. Uh, iron, the easiest way was sand, red sand. It's called iron sand, and that's what they made their metal of. So they learned the technique of working it from, from the neighbors. Their first blades were probably produced with Korean and Chinese steel. Then they developed their home method, manufacturing method. The production of the metal is done in a unique Japanese way. I mean, wow. The tamagani comes from a, a billet. That's a chunk. About the size of this table, a little longer. Okay? This black table. They build a furnace out of clay and fiber. They fill it with layers of iron sand, charcoal, and seashells and various materials to get the right stuff. And they fire that thing for about five days, three to five days, depending on the mix. And then they rip the uh, furnace apart. It's a one-shot deal. And they end up with this tub of metal. And they bust it apart with hammers, sledgehammers, the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> Masters are watching. Um, the sword master, the master smith, will go through and examine the edges of the fragments, and that's how he determines which will be his steel. He picks what is, in effect, tool steel. It, that's the closest we have to it these days. 
and you tell by looking at the crystal structure of the metal since it has been shattered. Okay, if you cut it, you can't see it. You can't hit it with an axe or a chisel. You'll bust it up. Then they take that material and stack it on a small on a piece of metal. Of metal. That'll be the substrate for the hammer welding. They use uh, basically rice straw, and they're really it, this is really great because rice straw acts as a lubricant and an agent that removes oxygen. Now it's not moving the stuff from the air; it's removing the layer of oxidation on top of the metal, which can be microscopic. It's called a flux. And when you see a, a, a modern blacksmith and he's walloping steel and, and crap is flying out everywhere, usually white hot sparks, that's flux. Um, looks cooler than hell. You can set fire to your pants doing it. Um, but, but that coal poor country of Japan has lots and lots of charcoal, or they'll make lots and lots of charcoal. And charcoal is the best stuff to hammer weld with because it doesn't cause oxidation. It actually acts as a flux. So the simple furnace that they're working with works it better. And then they hammer it out and elongate it, fold it. Now he's hitting it with basically a chisel and then you fold it over, dump some more rice straw on it, wallop it again. They are not creating Damascus metal, okay? Everybody thinks that to the point where there's blades made with Damascus. We'll get into that in a minute. They are making steel with a homogenous carbon content throughout. The whole piece will do what they want it to. Then they will usually take this slug, and it's about a pound and a half, maybe less, kilo, and split it and put a different carbon content steel in the back. Because different carbon content means it reacts differently to the heat tree. Remember what I said about 2% carbon? It's pig iron. You know where you see pig iron every day? Sewer lids and manhole covers. Those things get hit by trucks all the time. You couldn't put an edge on it, but it'll take shock, like a block of rubber. Unless you do it wrong and then it cracks in there. We won't go there. So they form it out. That forming out, that creation of the multiple layers, is what evolved from other countries. The first Japanese blades were not curved. I don't care what they said on ancient aliens. <laughs> <laughs> this is a close duplicate to the original Asian blade in Japan. It is double-edged. It is sharper than hell. Anybody wonder where it came from? <laughs> Form follows function, but it's got to start somewhere. Now, I will get into a little piece of legendary crap. The groove down the center is called a fuller. It is not to allow blood to drain away. It is not to break the vacuum when the blade strikes the human body. Uh, that vacuum routine came from a sharp enough blade of a certain geometry. When it hits living bone, the bone clamps down on it. And it'll grab the damn blade and you're stuck. My name's Kevin. Um, I, okay, never mind. Um, I, look, folks, I'm in charge of the stand, or at least responsible. Yeah. 
I am paranoid as hell until tomorrow night when all the guns are out of here. <laughs> you ought to see how friendly I am when we're bringing them in. <laughs> Yesterday I had a loaded P90 submachine gun. It was like, nope, nope here. Guess what the cop did? Held the door for me. <laughs> <laughs> we have a wonderful relationship with the Atlanta PD. They know that we are pros and treat them with respect and they treat us the same. I do not expect anyone to try and pull the bullshit that we do. Don't. You'll be in trouble. Um, we've worked a long time. This is our sixth year. So, the Chinese blade influenced the original Japanese blade, but you've got national pride and personal creativity gets involved. Okay? The fuller down the center that I told you about, what does that do? Stiffens the blade. But it also makes it lighter. Uh, when I used to give lectures about just making swords, I had a bar of steel, just a bar of steel, held it out and went, and I had the exact same thing. All it had was a fuller ground in it. Held it out, wobble, wobble, you know, it's stiff. So then what happened is they started to single edge blade. The advantage to the single edge blade really shows up in the combat with it. Because you do not fight edge to edge. That's movie crap. Sorry about that. <laughs> what happens if you take a bottle and hit it with another bottle? Break. They break. They're the same hardness. Japanese don't care. Japanese blade will break. I mean, you can take one and snap it over your leg. Uh, you will bleed. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry about that. Anybody see Shogun? Oh yeah. Anybody not see Shogun? Lots and lots of people. Okay, fine. There's a scene in it where this uh, warrior samurai is pissed as hell at the star for doing something, and he can't kill him. So he takes his blade that he can't kill this guy with, splats it into a tree, and busts it off. And no one noticed that damn scene. <laughs> you know, he snapped the Japanese blade. Um, they cut machine gun barrels off for these things during World War II in the charges, right? Nope. Nope. Uh, um, I'm a really military historian. I love tracking this stuff. And I believe it happened. However, it was like attacking the marine position with Browning water-cooled machine guns. And you can cut the water jacket with one of these, which will shut the gun down. The gun will overheat. But you're not cutting the gun barrel off. This is just steel, folks. There's nothing magical about it. However, there is genius in it. This shows the varying hardness in what's called the humming, the, God, I hope I did that right, the hardened edge. It's called differential tempering or differential hardening. That's who you're talking to. Same thing. It evolved out of China. I don't have one. There are yeons, geons, where that hardened edge is along each side and the spine is soft. Because the spine is what you block with. And you turn the blade and the other blade slides along it. And you can bring it back and go into your target. Okay, I got a bad back. I don't move smoothly. <laughs> So, the Japanese blade, let's call the precursor to the modern Japanese blade, would still have a hardened edge, but it's a straight blade, okay? Remember what I mentioned about genius? We 
we have a, a box set of six, seven uh, miniature katana blades in the uh, blade room, which are at the different stages of manufacture. And you will see it is straight all the way to the quench stage. That's when the curve shows up. And they have filmed this in the quench tank. Okay? Now what the... I want the dull one. <laughs> Master has done. Straight. They have uh, painted it with uh, a clay slip from the old days. Okay? Really thin paint. So that's painted on here. Then they use a mix of God knows what. Sometimes bird craps in there, um, and and charcoal and ash and clay. I mean, it, it, the individual master secrets were secret. Um, how secret were they? Tell you in a second. So they put a thicker layer of that around the end. Okay, the back edge. This is the part you want softer. Heat it to what's called critical temperature. In blacksmithing, critical temperature is basically it won't attract the magnet anymore. The steel becomes non-magnetic. I mean, it, literally, you're, you're heating the crap up and the thing, you got a magnet. Okay, that's critical. And that's how you learn the color. Because it becomes different shades of effectively red. Uh, it'll go to yellow, it'll go to white, it'll go to sparkling white, throw it out. <laughs> That's the carbon burning out of the steel. You have ruined it. A master, in other words, national treasure, uh, Japanese swordsmith will still lose 25% of his blades. Unless he's making an odachi, in which case he loses 50% of them, or better. So this master has taken it. He has learned the color. It's done in a darkened room. It's a religion. Literally, it is a religion. They go through a prayer purification process before they work the steel. And the big one is when they do the temper, when they do the heat treat. And that is heated to critical temperature in, in charcoal and quenched edge down in the tank. And you hear this horrible goddamn sound. <laughs> it's a screamy little chinky. Uh, I'm not trying to be ethnically unsound here. It, it's kind of a, a it, that's the blade breaking. And you pull it out and it's full of cracks. And you make a letter opener out of the end. <laughs> the film this thing going in the tank, edge down. Blade curves towards the cutting surface because it cools first and it contracts. Then when the spine starts to curve, I'm sorry, cool, I just ruined my story. <laughs> starts to cool, it goes the other way and it creates the curve. And a man discovered that. A man developed the technique. There are individual secrets of the heat tree, such as what do you put on the spine? There was a stage, I, I forgot to mention, I apologize. But that is, when you have the slip on, you take a feather, pull a slip, and you draw a pattern on it. Literally, a pattern um, of, of lines in the clay. And those will create the edges of the hardened surface. Uh, it, it, the metal is called marbon site when it when it's created, so it's different from the cementite and carbide that's in the cutting edge. And the carbon content is different on the back. And what it does is the pattern is significant. You can't always get exactly what you want, so they have a hundred different names for the different kinds. But what it does is if the blade cracks, the pattern 
will force the crack back out rather than let it go all the way through to the spine. You know, um, the blade doesn't want to kill itself. So that's why the pattern, then you have this thing quenched, you have it turned, and you start doing polishing. Um, it takes really another expert to just polish the blade. The smith will use tools like hardened steel, looks like a T-handle thing, and you're scraping it out to sh finalize the shape to adjust the curve a little bit. He may use a hot copper block and touch the spine to it, which will change the curve just a touch. But the whole process is secret to the point where there's a famous story about another smith visiting a master smith. And he's talking to the guy with his hand on the quench tank and his fingers in the water to feel the temperature of the quench. The other guy cut his hand off. <laughs> it was either the hand or the finger and got away with it. And it's like, okay, fine, you're wrong. So, the curved blade has now been created. The curved blade of a Japanese katana is not the ultimate sword. Sorry about that. There is no such thing. However, it is, in my opinion, one of the ultimate cutting swords. And that's because the curve allows you to strike tissue and as you draw it, it is always presenting another cutting edge in the proper way to maximize the depth of the cut. Um, you have a samurai, master swordsman, and you have a master knight, the knight's going to win. Simply because the uh, katana doesn't deal with steel well at all. Uh, on the other hand, It'll cut through leather. So they lacquered their leather. So you have the creation of the curved katana blade. The very first ones had a very fancy mounting system. And they were the only ones ever carried. There's a reason I'm wearing gloves edge down. That is called the tachi. It would really stand out if you had the scabbard on it. It's gold and all this crap. But that was a dress form of sword. The blade was actually different length, shape in general from a katana. This was a court sword, if you will. But it's still a weapon. And I mean, you draw this out and you can nail somebody in half. However, that is not as effective a means of attacking with a curved blade as that jump. This is a katana. A katana is <coughs> the Japanese sword. It is the heart of the samurai. Uh, it has a religion basically centered on it. And that is the means of the samurai. We don't understand it well in the West because we don't have something like that. There is a code of honor that goes with this. The closest thing would be the uh, old days of chivalry. Um, however, they killed a lot more people. <laughs> you insult a samurai, he can just stand there and cut you in half. And you smell bad. I mean, you know how they tested these things? Prisoners. Bodies. Um, sometimes not dead. Uh, the, um, I had a guy from the 501st Legion come in. He wrote about the armory years ago and came into the blade room and was like, wow, hey, it's cool, samurai. And then his wife wanted to see the gun room. <laughs> and he was nauseated. Guns, you. He's a he's a, a stormtrooper, and I was like, I'm going to put the damn Japanese testing chart out, 
just, you know, um, kind of the ultimate, no, I'm not, is shoulder through the chest, through the spine, into the pelvic girdle, and out the side. And then they look at the blade, and they're looking at how the fat sticks to it, and you know, the, and if uh, chaburi, where you whip it and all the blood comes off, well, you whip it and does all the blood come off. Um, and there are people where, you know, you're looking at, this is nauseating, okay? But you're doing that, and they're, the, uh, who was it? It's not the emperor, it's the shogun. Okay, fine, it's the shogun. And this other guy, they go, no. If you haven't the stomach for this, you need to go somewhere else. What does that mean in their philosophy of life? Go somewhere else and off yourself because we don't like you. <laughs> Balls to the wall. I mean, come on. Yes, sir. So it's probably apocryphal then I heard that they would test sometimes by beheading, yet sure. leaving a small segment of skin still connected. That sounds I, apocryphal to me, but... I kind of disagree with that, mostly because, one, um, it's a demonstration of the skill of the swordsman, mm -hmm. not the blade. The skill of the blade is passing through the tissue and the bone, and how well it cut that. And by that I mean, did it actually cut it? Did it splinter it? Did it have to go through the joint? You know, there's a whole bunch of this stuff in the testing charge. And I mean, they go down to fingers and wrists and all. They don't waste a body. I mean, <laughs> they still couldn't get that many. No bad parts. And the really cool one is stacking them up three, four <laughs> high and seeing how far you got. There we go. <laughs> now, the katana is impressive. It is not my preferred blade. Okay, fine. It's personal. I like the wakasashi. The, the match to the katana. They're a set. Uh, the reason I like the wakasashi is you can use it in the house. <laughs> Breaking in my house hurt my dog. I'm not reaching for it. I'm going to indulge myself. <laughs> you think John Wick can do it? Hurt my dog. Um, <laughs> I stole his car and killed his dog. Okay, click. <laughs> Idiot. Uh, I'm looking forward to number two. <laughs> He's got the pit bull. I've seen a picture. He's got the pit bull. It's cool. This is the Tanto. This is the third of the trio of a normal set of weapons where you would have the Wakasashi, the Katana, and the Tanto. Um, this you can always have with you. In most houses, visiting the right place, you leave the katana, the war sword. You could have the wakasashi with you. In other places where you can't have the wakasashi of royal court, leave that too. You can still have the tanto. And then there's a, a little dagger, which uh, mostly ladies have. We have an example of that. Then there's like, bigger is better. <laughs> um, this we're actually quite proud of because they're kind of rare, and this is a particularly good one. This is an odachi. You will not be allowed to touch my odachi, <laughs> because it's too damn dangerous. Um, well, this blade was outlawed for combat use in 1445. <laughs> so, um, Anybody seen the Seven Samurai? Oh, yeah. yeah. You see the Odachi? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Toshiro Mifune, when he is setting out the blades, why is he sticking all those blades in the, in the lump? Because they break. And he's got a spare. And one of them is an Odachi. And he can draw it. I can draw it, too. It's everything I can do to get this thing out of the skin. <laughs> I'm six foot four. Jesus. Um, they had a, a gun bearer. It was a guy who carried the scabbard. And it was like, oh, just give me my knife. 
you know, and the horse is suddenly a little pony. Uh, or the guy on the horse has just turned stubby down there into a stub. So it, it has its purposes, it's excessive. Uh, to a master smith, 20% survival rate during manufacturing is good. So it's also very hard to make. But, boy, is it impressive, isn't it? <laughs> and it is solely used today for, well, martial arts, yeah. But it's used for uh, religious purposes, okay? Sem ceremonies, if you prefer. The other weapon, which is vastly more common, and actually is a preferred weapon. What's the first weapon of choice? Naginata. Bow. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Why let him get close? Come on, <laughs> sir. You said that the uh, Odachi was banned. Why yes. Banned? Because it would break and you'd lose the soldier. Oh. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like, okay, you dick, I don't have enough to spare. <laughs> get rid of the blades. Um, there were other reasons too, but that's the one that I believe is probably primary, was just it, why? Um, it's a little bit like, uh, you know you know what a rapier is, okay? At one point, they had rapier blades four and five feet long. <laughs> because you would get this guy who's going out there and I'm going to have a duel with you, and then I'm gonna have a duel with you, and then I'm gonna have a duel with you, and I'm better than anybody because I got to Mine actually is bigger, <laughs> and I'm going to stick you with it before you can get to me. Which meant you're losing an awful lot of important people along the way, so that got banned. You'd come to a gates of certain Victorian cities with uh, European cities with a rapier that long, and they'll bust the son of a bitch off. Here's your sword back. <laughs> Sharpeners around the corner in the back. He'll put a point back on it for you. Um, that's kind of my, my thought behind it. Other than that, I've never really found the information to tell me. So I follow sort of my own logic and, and give you as entertaining a means I can, as I can of it. This is the weapon that beats the katana. What is it? I got it. Katana on a stick. <laughs> Naginata. Um, and what does it do? Doubles your reach. That's why this is secondary to the bow, because the bow goes way the hell out there, and this goes, eh, come here. Remember when I told you about the guy who can throw that blade and hang on to the thing? Reach counts. And as you can see, this appears very much like a, uh, a sword blade. Uh, there's Chinese version, it's the same damn thing. Uh, it's a halberd, we've got one in there. And they, it's just the form is different. The general form is the same because form follows function. And the curved edge allows a greater cutting style than the others. Um, I'm sorry, I can get really get wrapped up in this thing, can I? So you would see all these peons, well, yeah, <laughs> peons running up. They've got these things. You want to see a really great um, stylized uh, samurai combat? It's in the last samurai. Uh, there's portions of that battle that are absolutely great. That is not the part I like. It's the Gatling gun. <laughs> no, stop it. It introduces men to mechanical warfare. It's a machine that eats people. It, it, it's just, they did it very well. So, you know, you got, uh, yeah, evolution does that. There have long been Creations of weapons, where it was like, this is going to end war, this is going to put a great big ding in it. 
uh, the Gatling gun, poison gas, airplanes, barbed wire, machine guns, tanks. What finally did it? The nuke. My personal philosophy is the only way um, to, to bluntly save the Japanese people and end the war was the nuke. Um, I, I know what the buildup was. Uh, the buildup of poison gas munitions on our side, the weapons that they discovered in Japan, the casualty amount would have been staggering. Millions on their side. Mm, half a million to a million on our side. I don't know if any of you got grandfathers or fathers who were there, but you know. But yep. what happened? We dropped a nuke. The hell was that? <laughs> Drop the other nuke. Okay, this sucks. Let's not ever do it again. <laughs> and the world went, okay. okay. <laughs> what did MacArthur want to do to end the Korean War? Drop 16 nukes along the 38th parallel and build a wall that glowed in the dark. <laughs> if they hadn't seen what the weapons do to people and personnel and the lives of everyone, would they have used them? That's possible. <laughs> Looking at it, and the, you know, the shadow burned and the concrete and all that, it's like, let's not ever do this again. Are there any questions? What was about the time period of the first few Japanese? Um, I'm going to put up, the, I'm trying desperately to put up the placards. Sure. Um, I don't have it exactly. I believe the Xi'an goes back to about 600 BC, maybe 800 BC. The Tao earlier, probably one or two. First two Japanese ones are um, four to six hundred uh, AD, and then the evolution started. Uh, the legend is that you know somebody parked their ass in a cave on a mountain and came out with a katana and all this. And it's like, no, I think the man was a genius. I don't think aliens went in there and taught him how to do it. I'm sorry. Myself and a medical doctor, a woman doctor, two of us, when I moved, moved a 3,500-pound machine lathe with us, a crowbar, and a pipe. Well, pipes. Okay? This crap about aliens had to lift the blocks in Egypt, uh-uh. You don't know how to use a roller. Everybody, for some reason, insults our ancestors like, well, you're too stupid to walk. You discovered fire. Shit, that's just the match. Not the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. So, um, you talked about the Tao versus the Jian. Um, the Tao was commonly used in war, right? What was the Jian common? Was it used it, for? It. It. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, officer, it's the gentleman's blade, also known as the scholar's blade. Okay. So, it would be the equivalent of a Chinese rapier okay. carried in. Public. But you wouldn't go to war with it. You wouldn't equip your soldiers. You right? yes, you would. Oh, you would. Okay. But you don't give it to the grunts. Oh, okay. It took <laughs> more <laughs> delicacy and training to handle. You give them something they can chop up the other side with. Is that satisfactory? Got it. Yeah. Ma'am. So the curve on the Naginata is not made the same way as the katana. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hard here. Did they do the interrupted quench on the Naginata to get the curve up as the same way they it, it's, the it, it's not, it, it's a differential quench, it's called. And that's because the, the steel curve cools at different rates, differential. Yes, that is how it is created. Uh, unless you cheat like a mother and you put it in a fork and bend it on the anvil. Um, <laughs> I've never done that. <laughs> Some of the, who would you say was one of the greatest smiths of the age for these fights? Like the one who made the turning point for these fights? The man who just brought it up to the, to the commies now, as it were. I'm, I'm not completely sure. 
of your question. Um, Miyamoto changed <laughs> most everything. He didn't make the blades, he used them. He wrote the Book of Five Rings. You know, sir? Uh, so, in your opinion, would you say the Japanese uh, blades are, are somehow superior to the, like, the Chinese Dao and, and Zhang? Which is aesthetically more pleasing, a Porsche, a Ford race car, or a Camaro? Uh, each one has its appeal to an area and the person and the people within that area. So they concentrate their discovery, of, uh, their learning of the art to fit the tools of that area. My personal taste is towards the Japanese style. I used to, my martial art with a sword was Aido, the art of the cut. Um, I can perform it with a Tao. I can't do shit with a Gion. And then I see a Tai Chi master, and it's like, okay, I'm just going to call my plunge. Um, <laughs> you know, everyone, each has its aspects of superiority and inferiority. Uh, and the drawback is, it is such an emotionally laden question in Asia you get killed for asking it. <laughs> and I'm sorry, it's just because portions of it actually turned into a religion. You know? Um, uh, Taoist masters, well, that's the name of the blade. You know, these are uh, religious people. So your question would be answered differently by a Korean, a Japanese, a Chinese, and an Indian. Okay? Thank you. Sir? Do we have any sense for how long a sword would, you, would last if you're using combat, like if you can or anything like that? Do it again. Do we have a sense of how long it would last, like, in regular use? Until it breaks. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> oldest blade I've personally seen was 1,200 years old. Um, it, okay. God, please don't hit me. <laughs> You're talking about the equivalent of a cross. Kinda. Kinda. <laughs> so it's like, how long would it last in the church? You know, except, yes, it's a weapon. It goes out there. Um, it can be busted the day you won't go into battle. It can be handed down from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation. It, it's an object of veneration. Uh, that was veneration. Um, and as such, it's, it's treated so differently. You ought to see a guy just oil the damn thing. I don't have a kit here for, well, I got one, but I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> and there's a technique for polishing and cleaning a Japanese blade that involves using a, pow a certain powder, uh, paper, clean off the powder. Um, a rather wonderful oil in the original is a clove oil. Um, and the blade actually smells really good. And you put the, this on it with a, another piece of paper, sometimes a different kind of paper, because that oil doesn't get gummy with age, doesn't clot in there, and doesn't damage the wood of the scabbard. This, this is evolved. I mean, this is wonderful. Um, the other thing I will tell you is that you will find Damascus blades and people think it's like, okay, we're going to sell Damascus blades and they're cranked out in China and buy the dump truck, but they're actually good steel, good blades. This is not Japanese Damascus. Japanese blades are not made for the pattern. They are made to make the metal homogeneous in carbon content. And properly, properly polished. We, uh, in this country, will polish like 600 grit, and then you buff it. Well, what you're doing with buffing is smearing the crystal, the surface of the crystals, and it turns it into a mirror. Looks cool. Um, that's a buffed blade. 
That's a practice play. It's dull, doesn't have a point. Um, the Japanese use water stones. I've used water stones. They're wonderful. Uh, and the technique will go up. God, an 8,000 grit water stone is, is hardly uncommon. A 32,000 grit stone is a little harder to come by, but they exist. And when they polish, they are cutting through the crystal structure, okay? And it stays cut. They don't smear it for buffing. When you look at the blade properly, which is like this, and you rotate the blade so the, the metal, I'm sorry, the light goes across the metal, and you will see everything, and then you look at the edge, you're looking into the crystal structure of the metal. It's gorgeous. Um, there isn't any other weapon like it. And it's all because of the development of the techniques. Uh, last questions? Sir? Uh, I heard this legend once, I could be wrong, but did not Tokugawa actually destroy a lot of Matsumuni's blades because he thought that they were they like a curse on him or something? Probably. More Mas Mas Um I'm sorry if I screwed up the name. I just... Oh, no, I'm it's been a long day. <laughs> No, I don't. I don't. I, I do this off the cuff. Okay, you see any notes? No, you see blades. Um, so I, it's like, why aren't you doing it? It's because the computer broke down and I didn't download crap onto my iPad. Um, and yeah, I'll screw up names and dates, which is why I'm trying to get all the damn placards up. They're a curse. They have never all gotten up. Um, I don't think they'll all get. If they all get up this year, it's going to be an hour before close. <laughs> you know, and they're they're written on the blades. The question you've asked about dates and locations and so forth are on the damn placards. I've got the only set. It's a book that thick. There are about ten of them to a page. <clears throat> Sir, uh, the the center of balance. Do they do they vary per per blade per style, or is there a is that something I didn't, didn't think about? Mm. Well done. If it's a big question, I'm well, going to answer. Big question. <laughs> no. You don't know what you asked because there's the center of balance and the center of percussion. Two different things, and they're very significant. The center of balance is in the blade and varies in the manufacture of every piece of it because it'll move it fore or aft. The design of the blade, including the center of gravity, results in the center of percussion. And that's where the feel of the blade changes when it stops another. Thank you for approving. <laughs> you were doing that the whole damn life. <laughs> Every now and then you'll nod your hand. I'm like, okay, I well, got that one right. <laughs> no, no, interesting. I don't know anything. <laughs> um, I do now. Too bad I'm talking to the guy behind you because he knows. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I nodded that time. No, 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 no. Come on. I'm tired. <laughs> this is my fun. Okay? I never get out of the arms. I never see the damn convention. I haven't seen it for six years. <laughs> I got in a parade today because he said, Kevin, go out in a parade. I got to do the placards. Go out in a parade. Um, go on TV. I don't want to be on TV. I have a fucking rifle strapped across my chest. I'm on TV. I'm on YouTube. I'm on, God, I'm on a dozen or 20 YouTube things. I'm in a dozen TV shows. Always something to do with a weapon or talking about the Navy SEALs. It's what I've done. Look up Kevin Dockery, M60 machine gun. There's me cutting a wall apart with an M60. Because the Brits don't know guns, and they produce the show, and they're going, what's it gun going to do to the center block wall? Turn it into gravel. <laughs> no, really, what's it going to do? Turn it into gravel. <laughs> well, I'm telling you. I got a camera downrange looking at the wall, and I'm up here with an M60, and it's chopped 60. It's only that long. And oh I no, I used to be very good with it. I can still do it. I'm so happy. Because the first couple of bursts are on target, and towards the end, I'm hosing it. <laughs> I'm doing 30 round bursts, which you don't do with the gun. And it's just a big cloud of dust, and then the dust settles, and oh, look. 
Gravel. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it's me having fun. Um, so yeah, you can see me on that. So the idea of being on the CW is, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm 62. I don't have anything to prove to anybody anymore. If you don't believe me, I don't care. <laughs> if you challenge my credentials and I'm in a bad mood, sit down. This will take a minute. <laughs> um, I've had people do that, you know. It's like, well, how do you know about the 40 millimeter Grinnell Archer? Sound is going to take. <laughs> Back in 1972. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Oh, and by the way, I'm the only writer in the United States, probably in the world, with a patent on a round of 40 millimeter ammunition. <laughs> in other words, I paid my dues. I've had Ed Izzell, curator of military at the history, uh, history at the Smithsonian, say, "Paid your dues. What do you want to do?" Uh, so, kids are like, "You're a kid." Um, I will pass along information to the best of my ability. One of the things that I hope is very well received is I will be doing a series of books on the armory. And there will be a book on Asian blades. Um, everything I talk about in this and more, illustrations. Um, like I said, they put a camera in a tank and quenched a blade. Wow, that's cool! Um, a, a Japanese national treasure smith built a blade in Boston, in the museum. And they filmed the whole damn thing. Uh, all of this is extremely important, yeah. and I like to pass the information along because that's the only way the next generation will do uh, When I write about the SEALs and the men who have done these incredible things, I get to save history. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, personally, I met the grandson of the guy I wrote about. He gets to read what Grandpa did during World War II in Iwo Jima. Okay? This makes it worth it. So this is just additional. Um, stuffy as hell. i got to go back to my room. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.